Hello everybody. Uh, here we are in the third segment of uh, weathering and physical geology. The second segment, my glasses are dirty. <laughs> in the second segment, we stopped at the uh, hydrolysis. And remember one more time, the hydrolysis is the silicate minerals reacting with the weak acid in the water by the carbonic acid. And uh, it will actually produce uh, clay minerals the cations and dissolve silica. So you have to remember this is the hydrolysis, the reaction between silicate minerals and the weak acid in the water. Uh, and the production is going to be clay minerals, cations and dissolved silicon. So this is the short um, characterization or definition of hydrolysis. This slide here, and my glasses are better now, shows uh, actually a granite uh, and what minerals are changing into what by hydrolysis. So remember the biotite will break down into chloride which is very very similar to to the clay minerals plus um, iron and magnesium will come out then the the quartz. See this gray thing right here that's quartz. Here's another quartz. This is quartz. So there's a whole lot of quartz. Quartz will not do anything. Remember that is the most stable mineral on the surface of the on of the earth, along with the clay mineral. So quartz will not weather at all. But here this pink orthoclase, and that uh, will go into kaolinite plus potassium. Um, and there is. Biotite, I don't know if I said biotite. Yeah, I already did. So this is what happens with the granite. There is another one right here. And this is just the remnant, remaining quartz grains from a, a granite which went through hydrolysis. Remember, everything else goes away but the, the quartz. The quartz is going to stay quartz. And then this one here is basically the the product of the hydrolysis. When you look at the end result of the hydrolysis, basically you see what you have on your backyard, in your backyard, the dirt. Basically your dirt is nothing but clay minerals. That's what it has um, in it. Clay minerals and what makes it uh, red is the iron, the amount of iron. Um, there is another one, the basalt. And this is how the basalt weathers by hydro hydrolysis. The pyroxene will go into, um, in this case, the pyroxene is relatively unweathered, but on the long term, the pyroxene will weather into clay mineral, different kind of clay mineral. I'm going to talk about it in the, on the next slide. And then, of course, iron and, and magnesium will come out of it. And then you have the feldspar right here, which weathers into clay mineral and iron and stuff and then um, so you can see that the granite will make a lot of red clay which is basically around Roanoke especially we have a lot of that and that is from the weathering granite in the Blue Ridge. Okay so I just promised you that I'm going to talk more about the clay minerals and this slide right here that is this table and the clay minerals is like a group name, and I already kind of told you the Calvinite is one of them we, we have to learn. But there are a whole lot of other ones. Actually, there are books on just clay minerals. So uh, I'm going to drink a little wine. So these are just a couple of clays. And remember, we also learned about the clays that they, when they get wet, they expand. And when they dry, they shrink. And this is an important... Um, characteristics of them because this actually can cause problems especially when it's underneath of a house so here we have a couple of types of clay mineral and how much do they uh, expand because of the presence of water there is this calcium montmorillonite the sodium montmorillonite which is also called bentonite and actually mostly the mafic igneous rocks will weather into this bentonite and then we have the elites and the kaolinite we already talked about. 
I mean, look at the Kalanite. The maximum amount of swelling is 60% of the original volume. Where if you look at the Bantomite, look at it. It's 1,600% of the original volume. So just imagine, imagine that you're going to have an area where you're planning to build your house. And underneath of your house, the roof is a little bit bad, but that's okay. Underneath of your house, oh, this looks like a window. That's kind of cool. There is a basalt dike. And this here is all granite, originally. Okay, remember we just said granite is going to um, weather into kaolinite. And uh, the basalt is going to go into bentonite, the Montmorillonite. Bentonite, I just say bent. Not bent mounting, but bent, bent tonight, which is right here, this one, the 1600. So, when the, the clay underneath, this is also Calvinite, when the clay underneath of this house gets wet, what's going to happen? Wherever the Calvinite is, it's going to swell by 60%. However, whatever is under, you know, wherever the, the bentonite is, is it's going to expand by 1,600%. So what's going to happen with your windows, your doors, just the wall, you will see cracks because of the di differential swelling between these clay minerals. And it can happen really easily anywhere in Roanoke. If you go up to Bend Mountain, you'll see a lot of granite with major basalt dikes going through it. So... I have had students living in the cave spring area with swelling clay problems. So this is what you can see. First, this is the picture had the, 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 the clay, which is very prone to major swelling. This is how it looks like. So remember that. It, we call it the popcorn texture. So remember this, the swelling clay. Uh, if underneath of the road around your neighborhood there is swelling clay, this is what you see, these buckley roads. If your driveway has cracks and there is no trees around it, because, you know, the three roads would push up the, the asphalt, but if there is no trees around it, then, then it could be uh, the presence of swelling clay. Or it can be that you see this kind of sign on the wall. This is typical for swelling clay. See, like one side of the area is swelling different underneath than the other side, so it causes this big crack forming. Look at this here, the door. Look at it. It's crazy. And the thing is, what I wanted to tell you, that, that I have had students calling insurance companies, and when this happens to your house, and it happened to one of my students, the, the damage was $15,000 worth. And guess what the insurance company said? They said it was act of God, so they did not pay. They had to paid $15,000 for the damage caused by swelling clay. So you really want to make sure that you won't have this problem. We have it in Roanoke, but there are other areas uh, in Virginia which are much more prone to swelling clay. Like uh, my daughter used to live in Richmond, and uh, I remember that uh, especially al al along the river, you know, the James is going through Richmond, um, there is a whole lot of swelling play, clay. At, Actually, she lived in a house which was built on that area, and it's it's crazy how big cracks were everywhere. I mean, you basically could see through the, the wall, and you could see out to the street through those cracks. It was crazy. I almost was scared that it's not a very safe place to live, but it was cheap, though. Okay, so if you want your house to go really, really cheap, then don't, don't look. But before you put your house... And they, you know, how they flatten the soil. And you see any kind of discoloration like this one here. There is a good chance that that was a teeny tiny basalt dike. And there is a different clay minerals in this low area than everywhere else. So if you see anything like this, you have to stop, take samples. If you go to Virginia Tech, they have a big soil science department. And you can actually get those um, sample holders and you bring it home and make sure that you have separate samples from this yellow one and the reddish one. So they will be able to tell you what kind of clay mineral in each little segment so you know if you are with swelling clay or not. 
Now, if you are, then there is ways that you can prevent the problems with the selling clay. Most, most important thing you have got to do is that you have to make sure that the um, ground slopes away from the house. And you have to make sure that there is downspouts uh, discharging five feet away from the house. So you have to make sure that the water which comes off of your roof will not go under your house. Make sure that you do not plant any any plants around the house because if you do that plants actually pull the water close to under the house so they can the, the clay can get wet under the house you have to make sure that um there is no any kind of plant around the house which could pull the water as i just told you so this slide shows you all the part, all the things you can do to make sure that under the house the clay does not get wet because if it doesn't it won't swell so you won't have a problem so this is kind of important okay i talked too much about the stuff in between so remember the three kind of chemical weathering first one dissolution second one hydrolysis we just finished that the third one is the oxidation oxidation and that's what this slide is about oxidation remember we said that the end result of the hydrolysis is that the cations are coming out of the silicate minerals now when these guys coming out they are like uh, cations so therefore they'll want to react and the most obvious thing they can react with is the oxygen it's always around there are some elements some elements like calcium is one of them do not like they like to hang in the water they they have very high solubility means that they will stay in the water however the iron does not like to stay in the water it it will come out precipitate and react with oxygen right away as soon as it forms it's going to react with oxygen and make the the red color in everywhere you know your clay your car your sink your toilet anywhere there is iron in the water it's going to come out and stain the surrounding area and this here is the equation so fe3 plus or feo and it's going to make fe2o3 that's the chemical formula of the hematite and of course this is how the iron forms around us and that's why every soil is going to be brown this slide just shows the same thing with, uh, with, with drawings. And now we just finish the weathering. So this was the weathering. And remember the two types of weathering, the physical and the chemical. Physical just breaks up the rocks. Chemical uh, weathering uh, actually dissolve the rocks into particles basically. So you won't know anything about the original particles because the elements are separated. Um, and they will precipitate out later as some other type of rocks. Um, of course, when you have the clay mineral, you kind of can have some kind of guess what kind of rock it was, because if it's phasic igneous rock, it goes into kaolinite and so on. So you could have some, but uh, you cannot see anything about the original rock. Now, when the rocks are starting to weather, we're going to talk about the geometry of this weathering. Um, usually the type of shape the rock will pick up as they weather is depend on the on the joints the bedding and the cleavage of the original rocks just imagine like if you had rocks this is the surface right here and underneath of the surface you have these joints and like let's say layering and as the water seep through here you know, it first of all weathers the area around the cracks, like that. Then it washes out the already weathered particles, and then it gets to the next layer. So as it goes on, it's going to get rounded and rounded and more and more rounded. So this is the so-called spheroidal weathering, and that is an extreme example of spheroidal weathering. It's really cool looking, isn't it? Basically, the rocks, the original rocks are coming off like layers almost. Don't 
forget just like that this is called spheroidal weathering the best place to see this kind of weathering is if you go up to the peaks of Adder you know like on the parkway and you go to um, Buchanan and from Buchanan on 43 you cannot can go up on the parkway and then turn left and that is going to take it to Peaks of Adder. Peaks, the peaks are very very sharp mountain it's pretty hard hiking but it's worth every step you take because uh, you burn a lot of calorie and the view from up there is amazing and just about the same thing you're going to see. The, the, the rocks there are granite and the granite is very characteristically have this so called um, spheroidal weathering so you can take for your picture project you can take good pictures of spheroidal weathering at the peaks so do it now this is from Oregon and this is a typical spheroidal weathering at much earlier it see it just started the spilling uh, the layers coming off have just started so it's not really that grounded but you can already clearly see that this is what's happening here and that's another one when you can see it even worse. Spelling off. And this, in this case, you know, the water didn't really carry much of the weathered material away. But you can still see that it kind of exposed to the next uh, cycle. Okay, so now we have to talk about what kind of rocks will produce what kind of soil. So to understand that, we have to understand how the different rocks are weathering. So one important factor is that, as I already told you, the quartz is the most stable. But the olive and pyroxene and these guys are very, very unstable. So if you think of the bounce reaction series, as you go down, it's becoming more and more resistant to weathering. So olivine, calcium, these are the least stable minerals and these are more stable so if you get to the beach you mostly will see quartz and muscovite mica and uh, probably some garnets from metamorphic rocks but so this is the least stable i have a whole slide about it but i still write it so least and this is the more stable okay and this here is the slide it shows just exactly what i told you so this is the least resistant and this is the most resistant to weathering. Okay, so what is uh, what what is the weathering depend on? First of all, it depends on the climate. How much how much rain do we have? And then it depends on the topography. Like are you on top of the mountains where the weather hits you all the time or you are in the in the valley? But it's kind of not exposed at all. Obviously, when you are on the top and you're more exposed, you're going to have more intense weathering than if you are not. And I guess I'm going to stop the third segment right here, and I will continue in a minute in the fourth segment. I think this was the third. So I will see you right there.